Hello and welcome to another edition of Health Innovators. This is Paul Turner and very pleased to be joined today by Daphne Zohar from Pure Tech Health. Daphne, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm pleased to be here as well. So we're going to focus on Pure Tech in a moment. Really interesting model you've got and lots of exciting stuff going on. In fact, I saw another announcement just today uh, that you've got out there. Before we get there, though, let's go back a little bit further. I'd love to hear more about your background prior to Pure Tech and how you came to founding this company. Well, I've always been interested in entrepreneurship. I started my first company when I was in high school and uh, I became more and more interested in biotechnology and took a deep dive into the ecosystem of how academic breakthroughs get translated. And that was really what led me to form PureTech. Before that, I had started a couple of businesses that were uh, successful financially, but I, I sort of asked myself, is this how I want to spend my time? You know, how can I make an impact on the world? And I was drawn to life sciences as a result of that. So that's sort of how my journey led me to PureTech. And then in starting PureTech, what struck me is entrepreneurs like myself tend to get very excited about whatever they're doing and they will do everything they can to make what they're working on successful. Right. So, you know, I thought that, that um, to couple that sort of entrepreneurial spirit, optimism, problem solving with more skepticism, with an unbiased look at the landscape of technology. So that was sort of what led us to, uh, what led me to form Pure Tech was this idea that you could start with a disease focus and look very broadly at a number of ideas where most biotech companies get started by an individual entrepreneur, could be a scientist or a business person who yeah. gets excited about their own idea. So that yeah. was sort of the, my background in, in having started companies uh, led me to, to think about biotech and that translation of academic innovation, probably in a little bit of a different way. Yeah. And I guess to your point, that kind of entrepreneurial approach of here's a problem, how do we solve that? It's very logical, but it's a little bit harder in life sciences and pharma because the development cycle for medicines is so long, isn't it? It's interesting because there's such a mismatch in terms of alignment of incentives uh, with you know the, the time frame of how long it takes. And then um, what you end up having is near term sort of markers of success, whether they be financing rounds or you know who's in the financing or um, you know other uh, progress milestones. But really what matters in our industry is getting new therapeutics to patients. Uh, and that takes 15 to 20 years, really. So, yeah. And the structure of PureTech, so founded back in 2005. Now, at the time, the kind of model you've got, what I call this hub and spoke model, where you have your own assets, but you also invest in other companies. That was pretty unusual at that point in time. What, what led you down that path? And so initially we went down this path because we didn't have resources. We started PureTech really, I think it's an interesting story because we bootstrapped. Uh, we started with a hundred thousand dollar check from an angel investor. Wow. And at, yeah, it, it was, it was really at the, in the beginning, it was really um, a matter of how do we take these academic innovations and advance them. And we, structure these uh, these innovations and put them into subsidiary companies, sort of the the, um, the spoke. And then the hub was the management team at PureTech. And what we found was that it was um, it made a lot of sense to bring in partners. And, and in our case, it was venture capital and crossover investors into these subsidiaries. But really, all of those subsidiaries came from PureTech's innovation, you know, R&D engine. Sure. So we didn't go out and invest in companies. We created these new um, therapeutics together with academic collaborators, in some cases, pharma collaborators. And we shared the cost of development with venture capitalists and other investors. Now, that was sort of how we so we did that because of a need, because we didn't have capital. But I think there's some really interesting learnings. And what we've seen over the last few years is there's more of these hub and spoke biotech Absolutely. companies. And, and I think that the reason that that model is uh, proving successful for others, as well as for us, is because it does align incentives a little bit better. And I, I can talk a little bit about that. It also gives you flexibility and access to other sources of cash that don't rely on you raising equity in the public markets. Yeah. So I think that's the reason why it succeeded um, for us and, and for others. 
Now, what we decided was we were giving up a lot of value. You know, in the case of um, some of these founded entities, there's, you know, over $4 billion of value in the, just the public ones that, that we created. Um, so about four years ago, we decided that what we were going to do was um, keep ownership of a core group of assets and technologies and not share, um, not share sort of with other investors those particular programs. And now they're quite advanced. We call them our wholly owned uh, programs or our wholly owned sure. pipeline. And now they're quite advanced that we're getting ready for a phase three study. We've got two phase two studies and one phase one study and another one that's entering the clinic soon. So um, the model has evolved. It doesn't mean that we will never create founded entities. We, we still have the flexibility of taking uh, programs that aren't core to our internal pipeline and being able to create founded entities. We can sell a program. Um, you know, we can do a number of other things that we've done in the past. Uh, for example, we have um, in the past created uh, founded entities and, and monetize the equity. We have the right to receive royalties as co-inventors. There's many ways we can create value um, from the assets we decide not to progress internally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's clearly a good model given how diverse your portfolio is and the different types of individuals and companies that, that you get involved. And I'll come back to, I'd, I'd love to hear more about how you've kind of built this, this team around you. But before we get there, you talk about this kind of big axis um, on your website. And I'm really intrigued to hear more about the story of that because it's really complex, life sciences, treating disease is really complex. How did you settle on that approach? We were really led there from a disease lens. So when we're starting and, and uh, advancing a new scientific innovation, we're really looking through the lens of a disease. So we're focusing on a specific disease, working with the experts, the world's leading experts in that disease area, and looking at very broadly what's going on in the leading academic labs, often work that's not yet published. Sure. Uh, what's been tried at pharma? Um, are there roadblocks that the pharma companies have run into that we could address, and so on. So. Um, as we did this, this focus on the disease access that led us to this crosstalk. Um, so we've started with, for example, a number of diseases that led us more and more to the biology of the brain immune gut access. So this is really the crosstalk between the brain, the immune system and the gut. And it makes a lot of sense because, you know, something like 80% of immune cells and 500 million neurons meet in the gut. Uh, and there's some key components of this brain immune gut access, like the microbiome, which you hear about, which is very important yeah. host, um, sort of host immune microbial um, crosstalk, and then um, the gut epithelial barrier, and then importantly, the lymphatic system. And we decided in our wholly owned pipeline to focus on the lymphatic system and related immunology. So, you know, I guess the way to think of it is these systems aren't just like separate systems. They have, they're integrated almost into sort of the super system uh, which is um, sort of evolved to adapt to the outside environment. And, yeah. um, and so that's sort of um, the, that science around the immunology. Immunology is a core of what we're doing, uh, but the immunology and then that cross up with the brain and the gut. Yeah, and it, it feels like, I mean, you're right, the, the, the human body is incredibly complex. You can't look at isolated systems, but it feels like we're just starting to understand more about how these things link together and what triggers diseases particularly in areas like cancer, it feels like we're making a lot of progress there at the moment. Absolutely. It's, and and what, one of the things that we look at in addition to the disease focus is where is this sort of critical mass of academic research leading us? And you know, for example, in the area in the lymphatic system, there's some really exciting work going on at multiple academic labs and it's kind yeah. of all pointing in a similar direction, uh, which I think is for us really reassuring. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one thing I thought was really interesting about the way you're approaching this is you say you're looking at the problem and how do we tackle this, but not just from traditional medicines. You are looking at things like digital diagnostics and digital therapeutics. So companies like Sonde and Achille. Tell me a bit more about that side of the business and how you sort of moved in that direction. Right. So in the beginning, when, when we were um, doing the founded entities, and that was the focus, um, we were going about these, this disease focus in a modality agnostic way. And one of the things that struck us is how our brain is you know, dealing with experiences and digital devices, for example, 
Uh, and that led us to, um, to really work that was happening. Um, some leading academics were studying the effect of video games on the brain. Yeah. Uh, and and um, we were looking at ways that you could target um, attention and cognition. So basically um, take advantage of processes. In, in the case of Achille, it was uh, what's called cognitive interference processing or the way that we deal with distractions and interrupters. And uh, a scientist by the name of Adam Ghazali at UCSF had some really important research, which was subsequently published on the cover of the journal Nature, uh, which showed that you could train basically this ability to deal with two streams of information at once. And that training could then um, transfer to, for example, gold standard tests of attention, like the test of variables of attention, uh, which is used for um, ADHD, for, for diagnosing ADHD. Um, and what we, you know, there obviously there was a lot of skepticism uh, and uh, in our own team and board about uh -huh. whether this was, you know, just the game, you're getting good at a game. And yep. so when we were setting up Achille um, and one of our team members is now running Achille, when we were setting it up, we said, you know, what we really need to do is a randomized controlled study uh, comparing this to another game. And the game has to be equally engaging. Parents need to believe it. Um, that it's going to have benefit. And so the same game designers created a word game. Uh, and then we ran this, this um, you know, this randomized placebo controlled study and met the primary endpoint. And then it was subsequently approved um, by the FDA and the EU at for pediatric ADHD. Yeah. So that was a, an interesting, that was really exciting. We're also working, um, we created this uh, platform called SOND which is focused on using six seconds of voice to um, diagnose and screen for a range of disorders from respiratory to mental health. Um, and they've got a lot of data actually in areas like depression, suicidality, yeah. Um, yeah. but it's obviously relevant um, as you think about respiratory asthma, COPD yeah. um, and, uh, and others. Now I have to say in our internal pipeline, we're a little bit more traditional and focused because we're really, um, we're focused really on therapeutics um, so it's antibody, small molecules, other, you know, biologics, uh, but basically more traditional therapeutics um, in the area broadly of the lymphatic system and related immunology. But our past um, was really, and, and I think it, we still keep this idea of orthogonal thinking and not seeing the world through the lens of your own modality, yeah. you know, so you know, if you ha have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. We avoid that thinking. Yeah. And that's what led us to these, these, you know, kind of out of the box areas, uh, whether it be digital therapeutics or the microbiome. When we got involved in the microbiome, there, there were no companies in the microbiome. We were the first ones to really pursue that. Uh, or even what we call mechanotherapeutics, which is our orally administered therapeutics that act mechanically. Yeah. And I mean, where do you see that whole space going? Because as you say, I mean, traditional medicines, as I would call them, even though there's some very novel medicines coming through, they're hugely yeah. important. We're going to need those moving forwards to treat disease. But at the same time, this whole digital space is coming in. And as you've outlined there, the smartest digital diagnostics and therapeutics are being developed like drugs. They've got clinical trials behind them. So where do you see that balance over the next five to 10 years? I think that, that in the past, what, what was happening, um, it, and there's been a lot of tension, is that you had people from the tech world coming in and saying, you know, we're going to re-engineer biology. Right. And yeah. that's, that just raises the hackles of everybody in biotech, because we know that it's not, you know, it's not that simple. It's very complex. Cool. Um, but I think that what's happening now is a lot more openness in traditional biotech circles, investing circles to the idea that technology is going to make an impact. So whether it be, you know, this, this uh, you know, bioinformatics type approach to drug discovery and development, which I think there was a lot more skepticism around, you know, 10 years ago, just recently over the last couple of years, there's real breakthrough in that area. Um, and then I think, again, if you're doing the studies that you would expect to see, randomized controlled studies um, and, uh, really, you have people who understand life sciences and biotech. It begins to get very interesting. And, and now I think we're at a turning point where it's really um, yeah. this convergence 
that has been talked about for 20 years, it's actually happening now. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that 100%. It feels like the narrative has gone from even five years ago, the kind of, well, Google's going to come in and wipe out healthcare and traditional pharma companies. And that reality, as you say, we need all sides of this. We need technology, but there's a lot of expertise in traditional pharma around how to treat disease and those kind of systems. And um, that leads me on to my kind of next question around if you if you browse around the pure tech website as I did and you look at the team that you've got behind this, you know, on the board and the collaborators, I mean some hugely impressive individuals supporting the work that you're doing. How did you bring that team together? It was interesting because um, what happened is I had a couple of people in the beginning who really had vision. And even though we were very nascent at the time and we had this, we had this idea initially about pure tech that we were going to create sort of an institutional version of what an entrepreneur does. And so in my mind, there's, you know, there's scientist entrepreneurs, there's business entrepreneurs, but the sort of, um, you know, ideal scientist entrepreneur was Bob Langer and is Bob Langer in many ways, you know, so he's almost like a factory uh, in terms of being able to take important science and advance it. And, you know, there's been a number of companies that he's been involved in founding, including Moderna, uh, PureTech and, and others. Um, when I went to him initially and I said, I kind of, I want to create almost an institutional version of you, you know, and yeah. uh, he, you know, to his credit, jumped right in and said, I would love to help you do that. And he invested some money and he became a co-founder. So we had that. And then he, you know, he, having him in the room was a great attraction for other scientists. Sure. And, you know, so we got Bob Horvitz and Raju Kutulapati and, and just some really amazing scientists involved. And then obviously when you go into a specific discipline like immunology, um, where we had, we have people like Ruslan Metsitov and Sasha Ludensky and Dan Littman, all those people, I think they serve as sort of a critical mass that attracts others. Yeah. Now, on the other side of the academic innovators, we have some people who are these sort of hard-nosed pharma executives who are very skeptical, people like Ben Shapiro, who ran R&D at Merck, and John Lamatino, who ran R&D at Pfizer, and then Chris Wiebacher, who uh, ran Sanofi. And they bring the sort of you know, I, I think the tension between creativity and skepticism. So they bring that tension of, you know, the first time we brought up Achille, we almost got laughed out of the room because it was just like, <laughs> it was such a crazy idea. Yeah. Or Genesis Plenity, which is now also approved by FDA and, and the EU, is um, this idea that you, t you swallow a capsule and that would fill up your stomach and make you feel full, um, you know, and almost sort of act like, you're swallowing a capsule full of raw vegetables or something, you know, that's, that's the idea. Um, when we first brought that up, you know, lots of skepticism. So this idea of like thinking about what are all the things that could go wrong and then actually designing experiments that are going to, if they fail, they, they, they convince you not to do it, but if they succeed, they actually, you know, push you ahead um, a lot further than just doing the next experiment um, yeah. that you would, that would be obvious. And I think that's something we really incorporated into our model is like, let's do those experiments early on that we're really, all of us are skeptical about that we think might fail. And, and um, it, that's just part of our model now. And we, we really yeah. believe in it. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And as you say, I mean, there's elements there of, I guess the snowball effect, if you get a few good people in, it tracks others. But, you know, I also see from what you described there, a successful element you see in a number of companies, which is people that will challenge you know, leadership team that will challenge each other and not always agree and not always have the same skill sets. Yeah, and, I, and our senior leadership team also, you know, people like Joe Bolin, who ran um, R&D at, um, at Millennium and, and, you know, was acquired by Takeda. And he also was the first CSO at Moderna and, and uh, ran uh, oncology at BMS. You know, sort of a, a career, he's an immunologist who's been developing drugs for career, um, and, you know, there's just a bunch of people who um, have complementary skill sets, but we listen to each other. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's really important. Also, not being afraid to say, hey, I thought that way a week ago, and now I've been convinced otherwise. And, you know, not a lot of ego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, there, there is there are these people who have you think they have a lot of ego, but actually they don't. It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. 
and probably bonded by, you know, for the same reason you went into life sciences, people want to make a difference and, and do good things. And, you know, on that on that topic, on the investment side, you know, I, I'm interested to know how you found the investment journey. I think you said before you started with 100,000 in the early days, and I'm sure it's grown quite considerably since then. But I guess it can be tricky in life sciences because investors want to make money. That's fine. That's what they're there for. But you're trying to find that ethical balance of making money plus developing medicines and getting them out there. What's that journey been like for you? Right. So in life sciences, I think what's nice is you don't have to convince, like you don't have to create a market. Um, if you develop, you know, in our case, for example, we developed um, and, and we're a co-inventor of what we think is going to be the first new, new modality, um, new sort of mechanism for treating schizophrenia that's been developed in over 60 years, right? So um, of course, that's very important for patients. That's what drove us. But in that particular area, there's multiple multi-billion dollar drugs because it's such a big need. And those are all sort of targeting the same mechanism. Yeah. In the case of obesity, there's 150 million Americans who are overweight um, or obese that sort of fit within the label that we've got now for plenity. Um, in the case of pediatric ADHD, you know, these are really, um, this is an area where parents and doctors, um, you know, are not satisfied with the existing drugs or behavioral therapies. And so if you have something that works and can be delivered, um, you know, via video game, there's a huge market for it. So I think you start with the patients, but, you know, we, we obviously look at the business side of things too. And if we're not convinced that there would be a good business opportunity, then we don't, you know, sure. we can't pursue it because we have investors and, you know, shareholders that we have to, to think about. Yeah. So, I mean, have you turned down investment in the past because you feel that fit isn't right and it just doesn't feel, you know, like there's a match there? Yeah. So, you know, like I said, we're usually starting with a disease and we're looking at academic work, looking at pharma work and, and really pursuing um, new ideas, but because we're starting with a disease, we're, we're already starting with something that's a major need yeah. where we believe that if we could be convinced through clinical proof of concept that on the other end of that, there's a lot of um, financial value as well. Yeah. So that sort of drives us, um, you know, we have look at thousands of ideas every year, um, you know, in terms of what things we don't advance. We also do tens of experiments where we like, for example, try to repeat academic work or we do that key experiment. And if that doesn't go well, nobody ever hears about it because we don't talk about it. We don't bring it into our pipeline. It's, it's in the realm of experimental due diligence. Um, and yeah, we spend a little bit of money on it, but we kill it quickly and it. We never have to then, you know, talk, tell people about it or, or, um, you know, advance it at that point. It's just um, kind of an early project that gets killed. So those are, those are things we do, and, and we've designed that into our system. And when you think about those challenges, I, I often ask this question around the biggest challenge that you've encountered in building the company, and people often roll their eyes and go, oh, my God, where do I start with this? I'm sure there's been many over the last 15, 16 years, but are there, are there one or two key things that stand out to you as you're in that moment and thought, this is really tough. I don't know how we get through this. Oh, yes. For us, the biggest challenge has always been, you know, there's people that, that um, want to be innovative. We've always been so innovative that there just wasn't, you know, from a pattern recognition perspective, there's not a, many examples of companies quite like CureTech. Now, in recent years, there's now a wave of these hub and spoke biotech companies like BridgeBio and Centeza and, um, you know, Royvan to, to some extent. But when we were getting started, there was nothing like CureTech. We kind of sound like venture creation. We kind of sound like a big pharma, you know, in, in many ways, right? But there's, but it's a more like innovative version. Um, so, I think for us, the biggest issue has been pattern recognition. Um, you know, not not sounding like something that somebody just made a lot of money on. So, sure, you know, we're we're building what we think will be the next major pharma company, and you know, until we've done that, you know, we're going to be. Um, you know, we're going to be able to point to successes. Like, for example, we've had um, a rate of clinical success that outperforms the industry by far. We've had, you know, we now have 26 therapeutic candidates that have come out of our um, system, out of our R&D engine. 
of those 15 are in the clinic, two have gone all the way to FDA approval um, or FDA regulatory clearances and, and so on. So we can point to those. We, we generated 465 million in cash last year from the sale of equity in one of our founded entities, and we're still a major shareholder and we still have the right for royalties. So we have a, a number of these successes we can point to over time, but I can tell you that in the beginning, it was not, um, it was not clear or straightforward um, to anyone. You know, so we have investors that came in when we were just getting off the ground and, and the company was valued at, you know, sub 10 million. Um, and, you know, thankfully all of those investors along the way have done really well, sure. um, you know, but uh, I always feel like wherever we are now, we have new investors coming in. So the next investors have to do just as well yeah. um, as our early investors. Yeah, yeah. And as you've hinted at, as we've been talking today, I mean, you've got so much stuff going on. It feels like it's announcements coming out all the time. In fact, as we record this 9th of July, there's been one come out about a collaboration with Janssen Vorbeia Pharma. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Are there particular projects that you've got that you're most excited about? I'm most excited about our wholly owned pipeline because there's, um, you know, a group of projects there that we brought together that were, could have been different new codes, it could have been five different companies. They're all centered around one area of biology, the lymphatic system and related immunology. Uh, and I feel like every one of those programs has the ability to, to uh, make a major difference for patients that currently have no or limited options. So for me personally, I'm most excited about that. I also know that I, we have the most influence over those programs. The founded entities are like children that we raised and they're now, you know, in college and they're doing really well. They're even taking care of us, um, you know, now. So that's great. They're returning some of what we had put into them. Um, and I'm very proud of everything that we've accomplished through those founded entities. But um, I personally tend to get excited about things where I can have a lot of influence. And that's the whole thing I find right now. Yeah. And I mean, you as an individual, you've been recognized many times as, a, as an influential leader, an entrepreneur, and you've built this incredible company. Um, but I wanted just to touch on the issue of gender diversity in the boardroom, because it's still a big issue. And, and you know, what are your what's your perspective on that? What are your thoughts? What do you think we should be doing there? Well, I think that that um, one thing that is very positive is I feel like women uh, for board seats and for C-level positions are very much in demand right now. So that's a good sign. It means that everybody's trying to fill roles yeah. with, uh, with senior women. I think the challenge is that because there hasn't been as many women in C-level positions, um, there's a little bit of a mismatch and we need to be able to bring in, um, for example, women in other diverse groups that maybe haven't had as many opportunities so you might recruit one level down from what you normally would uh, in order to fill some of those roles. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you're um, compromising on quality because often those individuals are had to be extremely talented to get to where they are. And because of other factors, they weren't um, you know, potentially advanced as quickly as their male counterparts. Now, um, I think that, that, you know, in investing, I talked about pattern recognition, there's a challenge because there's something like two or 3% of all venture capital, like general partners and so on are women. So, and, you know, and that sort of begins the cascade because you don't have, if you're a woman, you might not have the venture capital investors and then, then later you don't get the crossover investors. Yeah. And then later, yeah. and, and I have to say, you know, when we started Peer Tech, we didn't get venture capital money. We built it ourselves. I mean, we got really great, sophisticated, like big pharma executives that put in their own money. And then eventually, you know, as we proved ourselves, we were able to get, um, you know, more of the traditional institutions. But um, that definitely was viewed, I think, in some ways as like not having some of those traditional venture funds initially was viewed as maybe not a marker of success um, and the pattern didn't fit. Yeah. And so it was harder. And so we just had to do everything, execute and show everyone before we could raise the money. Whereas yeah. if it were different, you know, you might raise the money and then, and then execute. So. Yeah. And the risk is because it's harder, as you say, it becomes a little bit self-perpetuating, doesn't it? 
Yeah, and but I think that as there are more examples of um, you know success, and I was so excited to bring Karen Mazumdar Shah to our board because she built her company. It's a multi-billion dollar company from her garage. You know, it's a very you know kind of in many ways very similar story. Uh, very inspiring woman uh, and huge philanthropist. Um, she's part of the Giving Pledge and all that. And she's now on our board. So um, you know, I think as there's more examples of success, um, there will it will forge a new pattern for investors to be able to, um, yeah. to look at. Yeah, I agree. And so as you look forward now, I mean, as I say, you've achieved a lot with, with Pure Tech in the last 15, 16 years. You know, what, what are your burning ambitions? Are there things where you're going, I really want to get this done or achieve this in the next five years? Yeah, so I think um, we've achieved a lot. What we want to do is, is continue to build our wholly owned pipeline. So in the same way that we took new ideas from you know, academic breakthroughs, um, our own inventions, and they've now gotten FDA approval and so on, um, and key clinical validation. We're now doing that with our wholly owned pipeline. And I think to continue to build and scale this, uh, just like, you know, if you have the top pharma companies, the big biotech companies, I really envision that PureTech will be in those ranks. So for me, that's the biggest goal that I have over the next five years is to make Pure tech into you know a, a major biopharma company. Well, maybe we'll do this into again in five years' time. Yeah, the, uh, top five or even number one. I, I certainly hope so. My yeah. last question. I'm sure you get asked this all the time because we're in a kind of age where there's a lot of. I guess it's quite an entrepreneurial age. A lot of people starting companies. Digital health is taking off, but it's not easy. So you know, is the one bit of advice you would give to somebody starting out, thinking I'm going to build my company? What would you say to them? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I think there's a balance between um, being an entrepreneur. And, you know, I think of like the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, like you're going to, no matter what, you're going to make it work. And this concept of opportunity analysis. Um, and, you know, you, it's, it's something that you learn over time, but um, the ability to have people around you that will question, push back, be skeptical without killing your spirit is something that I think is, it's really important, but if you get the wrong people around you, great ideas, you know, could get killed and you might, you might lose your enthusiasm for a really good idea. Yeah, yeah. So having people that have the right motivation, um, who really, you know, truly have your best interests at heart, but also can put a mirror up and say, you know, here are all the flaws and you, you need to know what they are. Yeah. So yeah. Not trying so to be, be that lone, of... yeah, not yeah. trying to be that lone superhero, which is something I, I hear a lot is, you know, yes, you've got to push really hard, but you need that, that team around you, don't you? Yeah. And I think that, you know, especially earlier in your career, when people give you criticism, you, you tend to want to shut it down and you want to kind of show prove them wrong and you can still do that, but you, you should still listen to the nuggets there that are valuable and, but you should make the decisions. You know, that, that's the key thing is as a, an innovator, you, you take it all in as a CEO, you take in advice from really smart people, but then you decide and you drive it. Yeah. Well, Daphne, it's been great speaking with you. I shall certainly continue to watch Pure Tech's journey with great interest and wish you continued success. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation and thanks so much for having me on here. Thank you.